Hello, my name is Jeffrey Beal and I'm a librarian at the University of Colorado Denver. The title of this presentation is The Problem of Predatory Publishers. Before I start, I want to tell you a little about myself. I am the scholarly communications librarian at the Auraria Library at the University of Colorado Denver's Auraria campus. Our campus is located in the center of downtown Denver in the state of Colorado. The library is located on the center of the campus, the two-story white building shown here in the picture. I've been a librarian for 23 years. I graduated from library school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1990 and then worked for 10 years as a cataloger at Harvard University's Widener Library. In 2000, I moved to Denver and began working in Auraria Library. I was a cataloger until last year when I moved in my current position. Today I want to talk to you about scholarly publishing and particularly about one component of scholarly publishing that has been getting a lot of attention since 2011. That component of scholarly publishing is what we call the gold open access model. In this model, published articles are freely available on the internet as soon as they are published and the model is financed by payments charged to authors upon acceptance of their manuscripts. These payments are now called Article Processing Charges, or APCs. The gold open access model started with the best of intentions. In theory, there is nothing wrong with charging an article processing charge, and there are some great advantages to open access scholarship. The obvious one is that it makes research freely available to everyone at the computer and internet access. Also, there's some evidence that articles published in open access journals might get cited more on average than articles published behind a paywall. This model represents a very large change from the traditional or subscription model of scholarly publishing in which authors generally were not charged any fees except in the case of some society publishers charging page fees. And only those with access to a subscription, such as an individual who paid for a subscription or a library patron whose library had one could access the journal's content. Journals using the traditional model can be print, online, or both. The gold open access or author pays model has its roots in the open access movement, a social movement that began in the early 2000s. The movement was sparked by the serials crisis, a period in which journal subscription prices rose at a rate greater than that of inflation, and by a desire to collectivize the production and distribution of research information on the open internet for the common good. Unfortunately, sometimes the noblest of goals can lead to undesired consequences, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. First, let me round out my definitions of the distribution models for scholarly communication. I've already described the traditional or subscription model. Now this is sometimes called the toll access model. I described the gold open access model financed by APCs. There is also the green open access model, which refers to authors self-archiving their pre- and post-prints in institutional or disciplinary digital repositories. This model, which is supported by a single champion, is beset by problems. One is that authors tend not to want to archive their work after it's already been published, so this is why you hear about open access mandates. Personally, I am wary of any publishing model that requires mandates to make it work. Also, for articles published in traditional journals, authors generally cannot self-archive the PDF version that the publisher produces, so you have to archive the Microsoft Word version after you've made all the changes suggested by the peer reviewers, a version referred to as the postprint. Finally, there is another model that you should be aware of, and that's the platinum model. This model is the same as the gold model, except that authors are not charged any fee upon acceptance of the manuscript. The publication is funded by an agency, organization, or association. Some do not make the distinction between gold open access and platinum open access, lumping the two models together as just gold but I think the distinction is important, especially in the context of predatory publishers. I should also say that there are some journals that use a hybrid approach. These are traditional subscription journals that give authors the option to pay a fee and have their published article made open access perpetually. There is a low uptake on this option. 
So now I'd like to move on to the main thing I want to talk about today, predatory publishers. You remember that gold open access requires a payment from the author upon acceptance of a manuscript. So the more papers a publisher accepts, the more money it makes. This conflict of interest is built into the gold open access model. In theory, it shouldn't be a problem, for scholarly publishers certainly would not want to accept for publication a paper that is not worthy of being published in a scientific journal. In practice, unfortunately, it is a problem, for there are many publishers who just want the money and could care less about scientific integrity. These are the predatory publishers. They are the ones that exploit the gold open access model just for their own profit. And this slide shows a copy of a spam email that I received over the summer from the International Journal of Science and Advanced Technology. There are several things that I want to point out about this spam that identifies it as a predatory journal. The first one is the prominent uh, positioning of the ISSN number in the upper right hand corner. In many parts of the world, people think that if a journal has an ISSN number, that it's automatically a legitimate journal. But this isn't true. We know that both authentic journals and predatory journals can have ISSN numbers. Second, if you look on the left side, it says call for papers. Submissions due July 27th, 2013. Notification of acceptance July 29th, 2013. That's two days later, and then the papers were published on July 31st, 2013. So we know that this journal is not doing a very good peer review. It's probably not doing any peer review at all and just accepting all the papers that, for which the author has paid the fee. We also see in the spam email on the right-hand side that the journal mentions indexing. Authors like to publish in journals that are indexed by the top abstracting and indexing services. So this journal makes sure to list its indexing very prominently in the spam email. Finally, uh, notice that the journal has the, the word international in the title. Uh, authors in some countries get more academic credit for publishing in a journal that is international than they do for publishing in a journal that is a regional or national or even local journal. So this journal wants more money, it wants more authors to submit papers, so it calls itself an international journal. History of predatory publishers. Before I go on to define and describe predatory publishers more, I want to give you a brief history of them. I am often asked how I became interested in the study of predatory publishers. I first became aware of them in late 2008 and early 2009 through spam email. I was on tenure track at the time and was always looking for new and interesting venues to publish in. I published a negative review of the open access publisher Bentham Open based in the United Arab Emirates in a library journal called the Charleston Advisor in 2009, my first uh, publication about predatory publishers. I didn't even coin the term predatory publisher until a year later, writing again in the Charleston Advisor in a comparative review published in summer 2010. Later in 2010, I began keeping a list of these publishers I had identified on an old blog I had. There were around a dozen, and I was keeping the list merely to document this curiosity. My list started to attract much attention in late 2011. I abandoned my old blog and got a new WordPress blog, and ever since early 2012, I have witnessed an explosive growth of predatory publishers. The list now has close to 400 publishers. Actually, I now maintain two lists, one of predatory publishers and one of predatory megajournals, for many are copying the megajournal model. These have a single standalone journal that accepts just about anything that can loosely be classified as science. It is hard for a journal or publisher to get on my lists. I aspire to list only the worst of the worst. While at first I kept the list to document a curiosity, I now keep the list to help scholars from being scammed. Again, predatory publishers are scholarly publishers that exploit the gold open access model for their own profit. They publish journals, a few publish monographs, usually multi-author monographs, with many chapters loosely organized around a theme. 
They also organize predatory conferences as a side business, a lucrative one, often holding conferences in resort cities such as Orlando and Las Vegas. Often they are corrupt. Their businesses are built on lies. Their marketing aims to fool people into thinking they are legitimate so they can earn the author fees. Thus they cater to the needs of authors rather than readers, the consumers of research, and they offer a fast and easy public publishing process. Who are their customers? Their customers can be people who are fooled by the publishers, scholars who make a mistake and think that they are legitimate publishers and end up submitting work to their journals or serving on one of their editorial boards. Unfortunately, their customers can also be complicit authors. Those who use the predatory publishers to get an easy publication that will count towards promotion and tenure or for their annual evaluation. They sometimes quickly put together a paper by plagiarizing from other open access articles. Open access publishing facilitates plagiarism. Here I'd like to describe some of the negative effects of predatory publishers on science, scholarly communication, and on society at large. First, I think that scholarly open access publishing has increased the occurrence of published research misconduct but I don't have any quantitative studies to cite to prove this. If anyone can come up with a methodology to determine whether research misconduct has increased overall, please let me know. At some point in your career, you may be tempted to plagiarize or self-plagiarize, but I encourage you never to succumb to the temptation because it's now easier than ever to get caught. Second, the effect of bogus published research on societal institutions, including the press, law, clinical medicine, and public policy, can be considerable. The press reports on scientific research, and there have been cases of the press reporting on research published in predatory journals, research that may not have gone through a proper peer review, meaning the journalists unwittingly reported on junk science. Medical research is translated into clinical practice, so would you want your doctor to read and apply findings he read in a questionable journal? Public policymakers also use published research in their work. And finally, lawyers use research when they are litigating cases in court. I know of one case in Nigeria where plaintiffs are using research published in a predatory journal to support their claim that a petroleum company caused environmental damage. The defense is using my list to prove that the journal is bogus and accepts papers without a proper peer review, so anyone can use an open access journal to say anything they want and have it falsely branded as science. Next, gold open access journals are author-centric rather than reader-centric. This is one of the main changes from the traditional journal model, which, were, which was by, necess by necessity reader-centric. They had to keep readers happy or people would cancel their subscriptions. On the other hand, the open access journals that live or die on author fees have to keep the authors happy. They focus on getting an increasing amount of article processing charges from authors, so they focus on the authors themselves, often at the expense of the readers. When they get the money from the author, the deal is done, and then they have less of an incentive to invest in things that will benefit readers, such as automatic reference linking and other value adds that traditional publishers now make available. Next, many publishers also operate scam conferences as a side business, or the conferences are the main business and the journal's uh, dumping ground for the papers that are presented there. I don't keep a list of predatory conferences, but they seem to be growing in number and I frequently receive inquiries about them. They are very expensive, generally, and are commonly held in resort cities like San Diego, Orlando, and Las Vegas. I think some attendees are complicit, getting their institutions to pay for their vacations. Others are fooled into thinking that the conferences are legitimate. Spam. One of the biggest problems with open access publishing is the spam it creates. I think this will worsen as the number of OA publishers continues to increase. Finally, predatory publishers threaten demarcation, and this is a very important concept that is too often overlooked. Demarcation refers to clearly marking the boundary between authentic science and pseudoscience. Peer review provides demarcation. 
Science has to have some quality control mechanisms, something that separates out true science from the false. Predatory publishers are not enforcing demarcation and therefore threatening science. It's not uncommon for predatory publishers to print articles that defy mainstream science, for example, denying global warming, proclaiming vaccines as the etiology of autism and the like. Predatory publishers want the fees and don't really care about what they publish. The enforcement of demarcation is called boundary work. Scientists engage in boundary work when they denounce astrology, for example. Scientists who blog often do a good job of performing boundary work at the article level, for they will show how supposedly scientific articles are really not scientific. We know that research is cumulative. New research builds on research recorded in the scholarly record. So it's crucial for the sake of science that no bad science be allowed to be made a part of the scientific record. But because of predatory publishers, this is now happening. Now to end, here are some other points I wanted to share. First of all, a Google Scholar, I see it as a great equalizer. It indexes pretty much everything and does not screen or filter for quality. You can do a search and find a link to a paper written by a Nobel laureate displayed right next to a paper written by an author who has plagiarized. In this way, Google Scholar may be a dangerous tool. It puts together junk and honest science. Be careful with Google Scholar. Second, traditional print journals had a valuable validation function. They didn't have enough space each month or each quarter to publish many articles, so they could accept and publish only the very best. So when you subscribed to these journals, you knew that you were getting the cream of the crop of articles in that field. The opposite is true with many online journals. They don't have space limitations and want to earn more in author fees, so they accept more articles, including some they should not accept. We are losing this important validation feature. I should point out that some journals are hybrid journals. Uh, they include both closed and open access articles. This happens when the author voluntarily chooses to pay a fee to make the article open access. One of the benefits that open access advocates proclaim about open access is that research will be made available to all people who paid for it. However, unlike scientists, the general public lacks the credentials and the ability to separate out authentic science from pseudoscience, and the predatory publishers are publishing pseudoscience. So they may accept pseudoscience as, on a, as honest science, a very dangerous proposition. Finally, there are many zealous open access advocates who ignore or minimize the problem of predatory publishers. I think that promoting scholarly open access publishing without warning of open access scams is negligent promotion. Some other points. What happens when you realize you have cited an article in a predatory journal? What if you cited bad data or a bad analysis? Predatory journals are a vicious cycle. The last six months have seen the emergence of several bogus metrics companies. People are increasingly trying to industrialize scholarly communication. These bogus metrics try to clone the impact factor. They market their services to predatory publishers. Here are their names, JIF, Journal Impact Factor, Universal Impact Factor, GIF, Global Impact Factor. Impact factors are important to predatory publishers because an author is more willing to submit a paper and pay the APC when he believes the journal has a good impact factor. Also, I am seeing the emergence of companies who that will sell scholars the service of promoting their published research for them, a service that they claim will boost your altmetrics ranking. They feature your article on their website for about $35. I call these companies article promotion companies. They're not illegal, but do we really want people to pay to advertise their research? I am often asked, what can we do to stop predatory publishers? There may be no way to stop them. They enjoy the same freedom of press that we all enjoy. They also operate internationally, and it would be difficult to prosecute them anyway. I think we need to ask whether larger publishers are actually better for the communication of science. 
large publishers, corporate or society, benefit from an economy of scale that gives them a competitive edge over smaller publishers. They can afford to hire experts in detecting and preventing research misconduct. They also have sufficient resources to develop programs that educate emerging scholarly authors about ethical publishing and about avoiding research misconduct. The open access publisher uh, based in Cairo, Hindawi Publishing Corporation, has a profit margin that is now higher than Elsevier's, and the firm has done away with the position of editor-in-chief for most of its 550 journals. Staffers in Cairo make the accept-reject decisions based on the reviews. I recently documented that some of the department heads for the OA publisher Public Library of Science, PLOS, earn over a quarter million dollars a year and one was earning over half a million. Neither of these publishers is on my list. There have been several legal threats aimed at me. One came from the Hyderabad, India based publisher Omics Publishing Group. They sent me a letter demanding a billion dollars. I didn't pay. Also the Canadian Center of Science and Education threatened me. They both backed down after lawsuits drew ex extra scrutiny to their operations, scrutiny they did not want. To close, let me say that more information is not better information. Scholarly open access publishing has some very serious unintended consequences that it has to deal with. My mission now is to alert scholars to these scams and help them avoid being taken by them. I ask that you help me in this endeavor. Thank you very much.